Welcome to Breaking Banks. And welcome to Breaking Banks. I am your host, Brett King. This is the world's number one fintech radio show and podcast with over 7 million unique listeners annually in 180 countries. We are glad to be coming back to you with the support of Plaid this week. We're going to be speaking to them in a moment. But before that, of course, uh, FinTech keeps rocking it. We uh, had the largest ever funding quarter in Q1, of course, for FinTech since the FinTech boom started in, I guess, 2008, you know, uh, is probably the year you'd identify when we started to see startups coming in the FinTech space. Um, but, of course, uh, we saw Varo have a huge funding round announced uh, last week, uh, over half a billion dollars. Imagine that. Um, great uh, great news for Colin and the team there. In fact, we're going to have Colin from Varo on the show next week, I think. Um, so uh, stay tuned and we'll, figure, we'll hear from uh, the horse's mouth, as they say, what they're going to do with all that cash. For now, let me introduce to you the Head of North American Financial Institution Partnerships for Plaid, Ian McAllister. Um, we also have uh, uh, joining us uh, Raja Chakravorty, I think I got that right, and um, also uh, Shalene Prakash. Prakash. Uh, they're going to be joining us in a second. But Ian, uh, welcome to Breaking Banks. Oh, thank you. Appreciate you having us, and uh, thanks for SVB for, for joining us on this podcast too. Appreciate you guys. Absolutely. So um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the pandemic and how you guys have fared through this. Obviously, there's been a big push towards digitization, but um, you know, what what has the pandemic meant for Plaid over the last 12 or 18 months? Yeah, uh, thanks for asking. And, you know, this, I don't think this is a, a novel comment, but, you know, just the industry itself has seen just consumers needing to leverage their fintech engagements, those services that are on their phone more readily than they have in the past. And that what, what we've seen, as I think many other organizations in the, in the uh, ecosystem has seen, like not just like an increase in usage, but also just like an increase in different type of demographics, actually leveraging digital, uh, digital apps. Um, and if you just think about it, the pandemic really reduced the ability to get in your car and go to physical locations to do banking or do shopping and, you know, digital apps, fintech apps have uh, filled that gap. Um, you know, Plaid is a, is a data network where we engage with 5,000 fintech apps across the ecosystem and 11,000 banks and credit unions of all sizes. And so like being in the middle, we definitely saw the increase just generally like rising tide, uh, like rises all boats. And we saw that, especially with our own engagement with our, with our partners and our clients. Um, so it, it's been a really interesting ride over the last uh, year, especially, um, what I would say is we spent, you know, we've always been developer kind of focused here at Plaid, but in the last 12 or 14 months, we've really tried to lean into engaging with our those 11,000 banks and credit unions really to secure the, the, those partnerships to ensure that their consumers, wherever they are, that they have kind of secure and safe access to their financial data that sits within their bank or credit union. So it's been a, a really interesting, uh, like time over COVID, but it's, um, it's also allowed us to see just an expansion of our own, uh, our own services and our own um, engagement with our clients. So Raja, um, you're the financial institutions mid-market leader. Um, you know, what's what's your role been over the last 12, 18 months? Yeah, so um, thanks, Brett. I'm really excited to be here. So um, what I'm really focused on is building long-term relationships with financial institutions of all sizes, from large technology forward institutions to regional banks, community banks, credit unions, and everyone in between, and really partnering with them on their digital journeys and strategies. And so um, when I think about our mission at Plaid, I really think about it as kind of this idea about democratizing financial services through technology. You know, we make it easy to securely connect people's banks to the apps they want to use. And the reality is that I think that spans across the ecosystem. 
Um, it is incredibly important that we're facilitating these connections for all consumers, regardless of who they bank with. And so our focus over this period of time has really been on engaging with institutions of all shapes and sizes and helping them move towards what a lot of what Ian just talked about, which is as things start to move more digitally, ensuring that they themselves are also ready to meet that digital need. Um, and Plaid helps bring them there as quickly as possible. And that's really been my focus. Excellent. Um, are you finding that, um, you know, for, for both of you, are you finding that the sort of banks that are coming to you asking for assistance or inquiring about how Plaid can help them has changed over the last 12 months or so? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start, Ian, and then maybe I can pass it to you. I think yeah. um, we have found, I think there's been a general appetite for advancing digital roadmaps prior to the pandemic. But we're all aware here that the pandemic has absolutely accelerated digitization. And so I think the big difference has been this real focus for smaller institutions and ones who may not have yet invested in their digital roadmaps, all of a sudden trying to think about, well, how do we quickly accelerate? And how do we start thinking about industry standards and understanding that there are shifting regulatory and compliance requirements that may be applied to banks to ensure that consumers have the ability to access fintech applications because of this trend in kind of consumer usage. And so um, in one way, we're still navigating the same sort of group of financial institutions, but I think we've actually gone much deeper and much broader um, and started to really think about different ways in which we address our products. And so that's kind of being articulated by our product roadmap shifting to ensuring we're meeting banks and customers where they are, rather than necessarily saying, hey, here's this high bar for a digital framework, come meet us there. It's really kind of shifted our view to, to, to change that. And, and I think it's actually resulted in some pretty cool and innovative things that we've been working on. Excellent. Um, Ian, I've got a question for you. You know, in, in I'm in Zurich right now, and in Europe, of course, there's a big push towards open banking from a standards perspective. But the U.S. has tended to be more hands-off. Do you think that um, you know ag aggregators like yourself will get us there in the United States, or do you still think there is a, a requirement for more sort of standard setting from the regulators in the U.S. in respect to open banking? It's a, it's a really good question, um, and I think you know, different geographies across the world have taken different approaches for sure. I mean, you have like you said, PSD2 in Europe, you have the UK with their open banking structure. Canada's leaning into it now, so they're trying to like learn their way into it a little bit. Uh, in the US, they've definitely taken more of a, a private, like leaning into the private um, sector to, to lead the way. I think what I would say is, I think that there's been very healthy um, collaboration in the US the way the government has allowed the private sector to lead this. And that's like a combination of aggregators working both with banks directly, uh, and we work with banks and we've actually signed agreements with a majority of the top 10 banks to have direct integration with them for their open banking uh, APIs. Um, but also through industry organizations like, like uh, FDX, which is like a standard uh, making body for, for API structure. Um, and we're part of that. We're on the board. So we're like, we actually, I've, we've seen really like good advancements from a private standpoint. Now, generally from a regulatory framework, you know, as I, this is, you know, as an, as open banking becomes more kind of structurally important to the industry, there's, there's always going to be like regulators trying to ensure that the, the, the industry itself is safe and secure. So I think there's always going to be a, a point that we think that regulators play an important part in that ecosystem. But right now, actually, we feel very confident with our relationships, both with those, uh, those entities like FDX, but also direct engagement with the banks and, and partnering with them to allow their consumers having to have access safely and securely to their financial data has, has been a, a really a big success story for, for Plaid over the last 12 months. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're going to talk about ACH integration in a moment, and that's one area where, in terms of real-time payments at least, um, 
you know, this private approach to things has really not worked for the US. It looks like the US is going to be the 66th country in the world to initiate real-time payments, um, you know, so. Right. I, I mean, the, the Dodd-Frank 1033, you know, support that we've seen for the administration too is definitely helping lead the way of where like the government and regulatory bodies see the country should go. And so making sure we're like lockstep with that, but we're, we're, we're big advocates of the, the position that the 1033 has come out with. Um, and real-time payments, you know, is an, is an adjacency obviously of open banking, which is, is quite important to not only just consumers of how they actually send payments to each other or to businesses, but also how they receive payments from businesses um, and other people. And banks are like core to that too. So like, again, if you think about the ecosystem of like progressing towards like a European type of model, um, you know, all the, all the signs are there. And Brett, if I might add, I think um, yeah, something that's really interesting from a policy perspective is, you know, there was that July, you know, Biden administration executive order on promoting competition in the American economy, right. yep. which I think clearly does move open finance into the mainstream of the U.S. financial services conversation. And it certainly is positioning it as one of the administration's top priorities based off of what we see. Um, and so, like, though we don't have the same stringent regulatory framework yet as what we see in Europe, um, I do think that it is coming. And to, to Ian's point, you know, the, the, the Dodd-Frank 1033 ruling also empowers the CFPB to kind of prescribe rules and regulations into the financial services industry um, oriented towards driving consumerized their financial data. And I think that executive order um, is really saying that open finance um, is going to be an administration and frankly, an all government priority. Um, and, and frankly, it also expands 1033 to more of a competition and innovation mandate. So, um, you know, my perspective and I think our perspective is that like legislation is coming. And so having financial institutions kind of think about that in advance and think about it right now is really important. No, I agree. Um, it, you know, and what we've seen in China is China's pushing for more openness. They're pu pushing the tech fins, the big wallet operators to be uh, transparent and open with their data as well. So it seems to be a real global push that we're seeing. Obviously, the 21st century is going to be built on digital services. And that digital services layer is going to need real-time um, access to data, real-time payments rails, smart payments rails, smart identity infrastructure. It's all a basic uh, um, requirement for a competitive economy in the 21st century. At this time, I'd like to invite Shailene Prakash. She's the head of digital channels and segment operation solutions at Silicon Valley Bank to join this conversation. Thank you, Brett. Uh, uh Glad to be here. I'm the head of digital and segment operating solutions uh, at Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, as part of the, so I have a dual mandate. As part of digital, I'm responsible for the end-to-end -end client journey. And as part of my segment operating solution role, I'm responsible for making sure that I bring all parts of the bank together in terms of giving customers one SVB. Um, this role encompasses bringing our financial proposition, our non-financial proposition, and our digital experiences together into one unified proposition for our clients. Now, uh, Shailene, um, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, obviously being right in the heart of Silicon Valley, uh, or at least, you know, um, historically, has been a, a, a key bank for um, startups. Now, are you finding more activity um, uh, in recent times? Because, you know, we know in Q1, the funding um, for fintechs in Q1 this year was was record-breaking. It's the biggest funding quarter we've had. So are you seeing a, a similar uptick in um, SVP activity? Absolutely, Brett. Um, uh, I want to go back to some of the comments that Ian and, and Raja were making around the impacts of uh, the pandemic. Um, pandemic has 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 accelerated the the uh, the digitization of the of the entire ecosystem. Um, much of what we much of what we see around us right now. Think about the the think about where the most of the innovation is happening. 
It's all these uh, innovators and disruptors uh, in and around uh, Silicon Valley. In fact, I'll say it's a global phenomenon at this point in time. And as Silicon Valley Bank, as the bank of the innovation economy, we have been right at the center of where this acceleration is happening. Uh, we have seen massive growth in terms of clients' need for new payment methods. We've seen um, uh, we've seen massive growth in terms of uh, the funding, uh, the deployment of capital uh, within the innovation economy. Uh, we've seen massive acceleration within our clients' own uh, product and technology roadmaps. And all of that has actually meant for us that we have really been at the front seat, I'll say, in terms of the digitization and the acceleration that has been a result of, uh, uh, of the pandemic. And also worth noting um, that even though pandemic has been really bad for Main Street America, uh, the company formation during the pandemic, as far as the innovation economy is concerned, has not slowed down. In fact, we've consistently added upwards of uh, 1,500 clients uh, every quarter. And so we're really seeing uh, the positive impacts uh, uh, as, a, as an organization that is actually serving this sector. Awesome. Now, Ian, you've been a um, Silicon Valley Bank client since 2012, I understand. Yeah, I think we've. Um, it's been a it's been a good partnership over the last uh, you know, decade or so. So it's uh, we appreciate SVB, especially being in, in the, the area we are and having kind of similar client base. To be honest with you, a good overlap. So. Now, um, you guys have announced this uh, partnership. A key component of the partnership between Plaid and Silicon Valley Bank is some improvements around ACH, which for those that are unfamiliar, um, ACH is the automated clearinghouse, the system that enables bank-to-bank -bank transfers in the United States. So um, who, wants to, who wants to tell us about the advancements that this partnership will bring in terms of ACH uh, capability? Yeah, Brett, I can um, I can maybe hop in, and then I think Shalene will be great to, to add on uh, details and a point of view from the Silicon Valley Bank side. Um, so Silicon Valley Bank and Plaid have partnered on an ACH integration to effectively enable companies to instantly authenticate account information in Plaid and generate payments via SVB's ACH API. What, what that actually means is it, it's effectively a processor token exchange and it's pretty notable in that they're the first financial institution that Plaid has partnered with to enable this capability. Um, the way I like to contextualize that is to think about like beneficiaries from the, um, from the integration. And I think there's four main beneficiaries to that solution. I think the first is the SVB business customer. Um, now they won't have to touch account or writing routing number for ACH payments. So effectively by tokenizing the data, will have removed sensitive account and routing information from the ecosystem and removed unnecessary parties from touching that data, which thereby increases data security of that ecosystem. And this tokenization functionality we enable actually allows companies to be compliant with the new NACHA fraud detection standards for web debits that rolled out earlier this year. Um, I think the second- So, so NACHA is the, the, the association that looks after the ACH network, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, I think the second beneficiary is the consumer. And I think from their perspective, their data footprint for their sensitive personal financial data is minimized in the ecosystem. I think third, and, and I'm sure Shalene will have some commentary here, but I think from SVB's perspective, they're able to make a more end-to-end um, -end full scope offering for money movement. And then finally, from a customer, but actually also an ecosystem perspective, I think one of the core benefits of Plaid to the ACH transaction flow is that we provide higher conversion as people making payments often know their credentials more than their account and routing number. We're, we also are offering kind of real-time authenticated data at the point people need it, which is right at payment initiation. And those benefits are applied through credential-based data. So where the data is tokenized, which really helps the core use case for ACH payments. Uh, Shalene, can you tell me a little bit more about how the API itself works and, and what um, uh, drove you guys to creating this API? 
Absolutely. So as uh, Raja was saying, this is this really started with what are the pain points that the customer is experiencing right now and how do we give them a better uh, experience? Historically, customers have had to have uh, an interaction with Plaid, uh, get the token for, from, from Plaid, keep it with them at the right time, uh, decrypt that token with Plaid, and then send the information to uh, SVB indicating to us that a particular payment needs to be made leveraging the, uh, the decrypted token. What this particular solution that we just announced does for us is, does for the client is, the customer now does not have to worry about the exchange of token and the decrypting of the token. Customer gets the token from Plaid, sends the information to us, and we have a secure connection with the Plaid. We leverage that token, have the payment information from the customer, and we are actually able to process that payment on behalf of the customer without the customer having to ever touch uh, the username, the, the the credentials, the credentials or the or the account information as far as the end client is concerned. So we take a lot of that pain away from our. Uh, from our clients, and we are no longer asking them to have to deal with the onus or the burden of having to handle sensitive information. Uh, so that's essentially what, what this solution has done, Brett, uh, for our clients. And as far as uh, the bank's uh, ACH uh, API is concerned, we've actually offered an API uh, for a while now. Uh, again, most of the differentiation um, in, in today's world is less around the payment rails and more around the experiences that we're actually creating around those payment rails. As everybody, uh, in as, as Brett, you know, and many of the folks uh, on the call know, ACH has been around for the longest time. Um, but most of the most of the differentiation that we are now creating and the and the disruptors and innovators are now creating is leveraging that core tenet of the ACH rail but building the right experiences around it to give customers a much better experience than they've actually gotten in the past. So are you guys acting as an ODFI endpoint, as a payments processor? I understand the point you've made about the credentials um, and the lowering the friction of that, but um, where do you fit in respect to the ACH payment uh, network and framework uh, specifically? We are the we are the payment originator uh, uh, in this relationship. So our client um, is serving the needs of their end client. The end client might want to either send a payment uh, or uh, or receive the payment from any entity. Um, and so we are giving the customers the ability to originate their ACH transactions uh, with us. Uh, that's the that's the pure uh, ACH API that we have uh, in place for a while now. And then on top of that, we essentially add this uh, authentication with Plaid to offer a more wholesome solution. I think this is just a great demonstration of like a uniform goal of the of the industry. And again, you mentioned credential deletion or like reducing the proliferation of credentials in the system. I think that's Reduce generally a. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's reduced friction, but it's also just the security of the consumer. Like you can, like we all are aligned with the same goals, which is like banks want to reduce credentials being proliferated out of the system. Plaid wants to, our partners at SVB want to, their customers want to. So like, I think this is just a really innovative way to, for us to think about not only just the consumer experience of how they actually get payments, but also just like a uniform alignment around goals. And when you see that happen, like then it's a very logical like project and, and activity that you want to do, which is like work across the ecosystem to ensure that like there's a safe and secure way to get consumers payments, which is just really exciting to see. Does it work at both ends in terms of the credentialing? Um, you know, if, if you have um, the, the originator of the payment and the receiver and they're both on Plaid, can you tokenize both of their details? Just to make sure I understand, so tokenize both the... Well, so when, when we talk about the credentialing, you're saying the main benefit is they don't have to remember their ABA routing number and their account number. Um, but that goes for not only someone sending a payment, but also receiving. Yeah. So um, are you tokenizing both ends of the payment? Yeah, that's right. We, yeah. The, the, way the, the way the rail works is we can tokenize either on the debits or credit side. Certainly, we can operate across the board. I think ultimately that is the benefit that a relationship with Plaid 
offers. Um, and I think that's why it was really valuable for us to come together uh, because it doesn't matter which side you're in, um, we're able to you know, apply that tokenization in both sides. Um, I, I did want to kind of lean into one of the points that Ian was making though, and, and it's kind of related to that tokenization on both ends. I mean, you know, right here, we're really talking about a specific partnership um, that is constructed around money movement and payment initiation. Um, but I agree with Ian that the reality is that data removal is huge and it actually applies across a much broader narrative. And so when, you know, on the payments front, you know, this is going to help facilitate a more efficient ACH payment system for SVB clients, you know, removing the need for clients to take on additional compliance or information security risk, they assume when holding the data themselves. But our relationship with SVB, you alluded to how long it's been, it actually stands across a lot of different initiatives. And we're very excited to be talking specifically about the payments initiative, but we're additionally partnering on uh, data access initiatives um, to ensure that SVB clients have connectivity to an ecosystem of fintech applications through APIs as well, while minimizing the amount of credentials floating through that same ecosystem. And so from my perspective, you know, the net impact of this kind of multi-prong partnership for two innovative uh, institutions is a more connected financial services ecosystem that is more secure and certainly more efficient. Absolutely. And uh, just uh, to get the nature of the relationship right, um, this is not an exclusive relationship between you guys, right? That, that's correct. It's not an exclusive relationship, but I think uh, what's important, you know, from our perspective, um, the relationship, you know, we've had a really, I think, wonderful journey. At least I, I can say that it's, um, you know, looking at ourselves, I, I think it's been a wonderful journey with Plaid where we've you know, really evolved across our offerings where we were originally really focused on, I, we've always been focused on this mission of securely connecting people's banks to apps they want to use. Um, but do, predominantly, we were really focused on empowering fintechs. And I think over the last year plus, we've really understood that it's about creating a bi-directional or actually multi-directional network where all of the constituents um, are benefiting. And so what I think is unique about the relationship with SVB is one, obviously this is the first kind of ACH token partnership that we've done. Um, but two, we're, we're really kind of, I think, um, we're really capitalizing on that opportunity to partner in many directions. And those many directions are what we think the impact of open finance is going to be. Um, and so while this is not exclusive, I think our relationship is really, really strong. And I've really appreciated working with Shalene and team and, um, and thinking through net new use cases, which we haven't yet built, but can be empowered by open finance. In fact, I'd, I'd like to talk about that after the break, but let's just go to a break. You're listening to Breaking Banks. We're talking with Plaid and Silicon Valley Bank about their recent partnership to uh, improve on ACH payments in the US, uh, particularly for Plaid users. Um, but uh, we'll be right back after this break and uh, see you again shortly. Welcome back to Breaking Banks. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, we're talking to Plaid and Silicon Valley Bank Maybe, Ian, I'll start with you. Um, you know, obviously, open banking is, is sort of one trajectory where we're trying to make financial services more accessible, the data that customers have more open, that they can learn more from that. More, We're seeing a lot more tools emerge in terms of things that help us save, things that help us invest. Um, but where does this sort of broad trajectory take us over the next five to 10 years. What are the big benefits of open banking and systems like Plaid for customers day to day in terms of you know, managing their money and their, their access to the financial services ecosystem? Yeah, I, I think, so th thanks, Brett. Um, first of all, the way Plaid thinks about it is the consumers really are at the heart of everything we do and ensuring that when consumers need access to their financial data to help them engage with digital apps, like that we're there to do that in, like, in real time. And I, I underlined real time because that's important. That's, that's where generally the industry across both data sharing, payments, I, 
other types of it has to be it, it just be has time. to be a core core element right you know, yeah our phone calls are real time our texts are real time right. video conferencing real time why isn't money exactly I, I agree but you also have to just in the framework of how Platt thinks about it, we, we really have kind of core principles around control, security, and transparency, even if it's real time. So I think the important thing is that a consumer, an end user, feels that they have the right control of both, both their data, of how it's being shared, how it's being used, that they have the ability to turn it on and off. They have transparency of where that data is going. So like those third-party apps that actually may be helping facilitate payments, that they're being powered make sure that 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 is transparent to the end user um and i just think it's an it's the responsibility of plaid and other organizations in the ecosystem ensure that like the consumer has a very active visible ability that they can improve that transparency of again where those controls are and where their data is shared and the security i mean the security is is kind of foundational to everything we do so wherever you go in real time it has to have those elements of of control, transparency, and security to ensure consumers are protected. Um, and I know that like everyone in the ecosystem uh, believes this because it's again, it's just foundational. But wherever we go, and if it's real-time payments, which you know in the US, we are again leaning into real-time payments, while other uh, geographic areas like Europe, uh, UK have already uh, moved in that direction. Um, it's really part and parcel to ensure that the real-time data and the real-time payments are are controlled with those with those kind of core principles. Um, but I do think in the U.S. you're seeing you know real-time payments both from TCH FedNow is coming out in a few years. Um, you know Zelle has been a real-time payments rail um, for consumer payment uh, person-to-person payments for a while. But how does that actually progress in the future? Um, I mean, open banking is kind of the core to that. Yeah, I think we're all really looking forward to Fed later. Yeah. Um, uh, Sorry. Little, little breaking banks joke there. Go ahead, Roger. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, if I may add, um, I totally agree with Ian that I think the key to future payments use case is oriented around data. Um, you know, when, when we look at new payment solutions, I think they're a lot more designed to meet consumers where they are. Um, and whether that be oriented around the digitization of many common payment methods, proliferation of apps to make payments seamlessly, either digitally or in the real world, actually, um, or through accessing kind of new and innovative tools so that consumers can make purchases of things maybe they would have hesitated to before, but because of the presence of budgeting apps that are integrated real time with the consumer financial health, they're able to understand affordability in the moment. Um, and I think, you know, for us, FinTech is really that bridge that allows that to happen. Um, you had referenced, you know, kind of the pandemic. We, we talked a little bit about the pandemic earlier, um, but I think we had some. Eye, we saw some eye-opening stats. Like 69% of Americans found fintech to be a lifeline to manage their money during COVID. Um, and not only that, but digital finance isn't is it's really for everyone now, not just millennials or Gen Zers. You know, um, we saw a stat that said 65% of boomers are using fintech after COVID, and that would be the new normal for managing money. And that's, I think, a novel concept, but it really plays into this idea that like use cases are broad, real time and in context offers are creating a more curated experience for consumers, but also for companies serving them. And data is that bridge that allows companies to create relevancy. And, and there's myriad use cases um, to, to support that. Yeah, I, I, I want to get to Shalene in a moment, but I don't know if you guys heard this stat, but um, Chinese consumers on average do three fintech um, initiated payments a day now in China. Pretty wild. I mean, I don't even make three payments a day on my credit card, I guess. But, well, you know, I probably do. There's, like, automated payments and things like that. But, um, yeah. yeah but, you know, honestly, Brett, like, as as the, as the we kind of come out of the pandemic, I think, like, that digital future is integrating into real world also, right? So, absolutely. like, you know, we talk a lot, like, through the industry about this blurring of the line between, you know, digital and physical. But real-time data actually makes that applicable now. And as we start to emerge, like I can easily see that three times turning into six or nine because people are actually going to go out and get coffee or they're going to do all of those things that they do. Um, so um, it makes a lot of sense. 
So, Shalene, coming back to you and Silicon Valley Bank, uh, you know, we've been talking about at a macro level, uh, you know, what's sort of forming the future of the financial services uh, or banking space from a regulatory perspective and so forth. But what's specifically on SVB's roadmap that sort of aligns with these changes that are taking a place at a macro level? Yeah. So, um the one thing that is very unique, uh, I'll say about Silicon Valley Bank, is the is the is the ability to actually see what what kind of disruptions and innovations are happening with the broader ecosystem. As the bank of the innovation economy, we have a front row seat to these disruptions, and we feel very fortunate to be a partner and ally to all these fintechs and consumer tech and enterprise tech companies that are that are questioning the traditional ways of how payments have been done, that are questioning traditional ways of uh, how money has moved, and that are actually questioning the traditional ways of how stuff has generally happened from an experience perspective. So we're really fortunate to be here to, to, to support and, uh, and help uh, our customers uh, disrupt these these uh, these these age old methods in many ways i'll say how we're doing that uh, i'll say three different uh, uh, vectors in which we are working the first vector is making sure that we are we have the right products in place now we are a bank most many of the fintechs are relying on us and of course other banks from a foundational rail perspective if i'm a fintech i don't want to basically build the connectivity to uh, uh, the ACH system and the wire system and the RTP myself. I want to partner with the bank that can actually give me all those connections. Uh, and so that's number one. As, a, as an organization, we want to make sure that we have the right set of products that are going to be leveraged by, by this client base that we're talking about. The second one, which is, which is something that Raja was emphasizing upon, it's not that these many of these products have existed for many, many years now, ACH and wires, and I'll say for that matter, push to card uh, have existed for a long time. What many of the innovators and disruptors have done in the absence of real-time payments, rails actually being available in the US, have actually take, taken some of the traditional rails and brought them together in, you, in, in new and innovative ways that has actually given customers the ability to process real-time payments, even though at the back end, Many of those settlements, are st- many of those transactions are still settling on a non-real-time basis, leveraging the traditional rails. So what we're doing on this vector is giving customers the ability, leveraging open banking tools, leveraging uh, uh, APIs, to give customers the ability to create their own recipes. We're actually serving them all the ingredients in a manner that they can actually bring them together and create the recipes the way they want. So that's the second vector. And the third piece I'll say, which is very important, and again, you know, Plaid and us are together on this call is, we don't see our role as just being the bank that is providing the rails, and we don't see the role of Plaid as just being the the, 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 the firm that is actually enabling open banking and the interconnectedness to the broader uh, financial ecosystem. The third vector is for us to actually bring the best of what bank and fintechs like Plaid have to offer. Why do our clients have to work with banks on one hand and go and have a relationship with five or maybe a dozen other fintechs out there? How about we as the Bank of the Innovation Economy, as partners to Plaid, Plaid has been a partner as well as a client of SVB for uh, for years. How do we actually, as how do we play the role of being that glue that brings the best that the industry has to offer so that the customer have you know these uh, these wholesome packages go out and and have multiple relationships with multiple partners out there and then have to figure out the interoperability and how the integrations and connections would work through this partnership we are demonstrating that we are actually going to be working together with Plaid with other innovative players out there to give customers a very easy way to leverage the best that the financial ecosystem providers have to offer and really accelerate their own journey in terms of bringing unique and innovative experiences to market much faster than if they were to do everything themselves. So um, we've just seen the inspiration for a mission from SpaceX, uh, the the first privately uh, uh, chartered or uh, total private crew. 
uh, in a spacecraft orbiting the planet. Um, they've just landed successfully. Um, but for SpaceX, SpaceX's dominance of the space industry comes from this first principles design thinking that Elon Musk often talks about. We've seen it also with the iPhone design, and we're seeing it now in respect to first principles. But when we talk about ACH or real-time payment rails, if you are designing uh, – I'll direct this to Ian initially – if you're designing new smart rails from scratch today, how would they be fundamentally different from the bank-to-bank -bank payments rails and infrastructure we have today in the United States? Well, I, I'm more than happy to take a swing at it. Uh, <laughs> I know it's from left field, and I didn't ask no, that's to right. you for the question. But. No, I think that's that's okay because you know I do go back to a couple of things that I, I had just. I just mentioned, which was like the principles of how we think about consumers in the ecosystem. So first of all, it needs to be built, like from a technology standpoint, APIs, real-time APIs are like the core to that type of infrastructure. So I'm not a technologist, but from a principle standpoint for the consumer, if the consumer is at, at the heart of everything we do, and we need to ensure that they have financial freedom wherever they want to engage with their own financial data. They need to have that control. They need to have transparency and security. I just go back to those principles of ensuring that the consumers are safe and secure, however the payments platform is, is built. And at the same time, built on a technological like backbone that does provide real-time feedback, both to the consumer where they are, but also to their financial institutions so they understand that they need to share that data back and forth. That can proliferate kind of again, an open banking industry where consumers can bank, can actually transact and initiate payments really anywhere, but what, with the safety and security of the infrastructure of the control, transparency, and secure, security, where they can you know, turn off any type of engagement with any of those financial apps at any point in time, wherever they are, either at, at, that, at that FinTech app, at their bank, at a Plaid portal, wherever it is. But I think it's really making sure that the consumer is at the, is at the heart of those principles and their, their, their experience. Roger, you mentioned budgeting tools. Budgeting is 120 years old right now. Um, you know, we, we, we know that for the vast majority of Americans, at least, um, that they actually are not successful at using budgeting. We know that financial education is waning right now. So, you know, what are the types of tools that are going to give consumers more control over their finances moving forward if if budgeting actually doesn't work? You know, what, what are the levers that um, we have in our financial lives to improve our financial health if it doesn't require that disciplined approach that budgeting requires? I think I'll actually relate it back to what Ian was just talking about, but I always think there's this concept about like it doesn't work today because of the way in which it may have been built. But the real time nature of a budgeting tool that is able to, in context, meet the consumer at a point of purchase or at a decision point, I think starting to connect those things are what will make those types of things be incredibly valuable. And so like uh, a financial coach in your pocket, right? Yeah, or in your smart glasses, or however you actually right, right, right. want to think about that future of whatever technology interface you utilize to be able to communicate, um, you know, with your financial life. Um, you know, I think we, we we focus a lot on payments here, but when I think about like reconstructing a future, that set to me is really exciting because you might rethink about what open finance is and all the use cases it entails. And though payments, you know, traditionally may have been like a specific sector of financial services that sat here. And then, you know, you have other banking services here and you have like all of these different things that are kind of side by side. I think the, the future is one that is like intertwined like a spider web. And so I think you're already starting to see that. And we've seen developments for traditionally technology companies touching into payments or other financial services like 
Microsoft adding a personal financial management tool last year, or Samsung and SoFi partnering together to launch Samsung Money, which effectively consolidates a cash management account, debit card, and other benefits all into the Samsung device and the Samsung Pay. Um, and then like Apple or Starbucks, Amazon, Google, like all of these companies have made significant steps um, over the past one to two years with new payment options, with new credit cards, with new lending platforms, and a lot more. And then we've kind of touched on buy now, pay later before, but like that really embeds finance at the point of need. And it's higher converting because it meets customers where they are. And so there's all of those things, but then there's also these other areas that are things like access to paychecks or helping people find jobs faster or seeking financial advice. Like all of those things should be and can be intertwined because of the nature of data and the real time ability to connect to people right when they need it. And so to me, like that blurring of the line actually operates across all financial services. And that's why we're so excited about open finance. Shalene, um, you know, we've seen over the last couple of years that mobile wallets have overtaken plastic cards, credit cards and debit cards for day-to-day discretionary spending in the rest of the world. Um, you know, particularly, obviously, in China, but it's happening in um, you know Asia and Africa as well. Um, we're also seeing the contextualization of credit, buy now, pay later. So, um, where do you think that takes us in terms of you know thinking about payments in the smart glasses world, or with the Amazon Go, where the cashier disappears? Um, you know, how long is it going to take U.S. banks to detach from the form factor of a plastic card? Do you think? I wish I had the uh, the crystal ball uh, breath on on some of these things. Uh, unfortunately, I don't. But there are, I'll say there are there are three universal truths as far as clients' expectation is concerned around payments. Uh, and then I'll talk about what are we doing. Uh, the three universal truths I'll say about payments: number one, uh, speed. Um, the, the the actual definition of uh, what is fast today is definitely going to change over time. But one thing is very certain that customers' expectation around speed will continue to evolve and customers do desire speed. We were talking about real-time payments just a few minutes back. The second one, as, as Ian and Raja were alluding to, is security. Um, we don't have to we don't have to spend much time on that, but it is it is it is a universal need. It's a it's a fundamental need. And the third one, and this is where I think we've seen most of the innovation. This is simplicity. You think at what uh, what uh, Uber has done. You think about what uh, Amazon has done with uh, the cashless store. Um, it's all about simplicity. So those are the three fundamental truths. You know, speed, security, and uh, simplicity that have, are, and will continue to define uh, customers' uh, behavior. Now, as far as uh, uh, banks are concerned, and I, I, I do think Silicon Valley Bank uh, is, is unique in this respect, where not only are we serving the needs of uh, corporate treasurers, many of these uh, innovation economy clients use us for their own treasury services, and we're continuing to meet them the way they want to interact with us, uh, whether somebody wants to consume us leveraging the bank's assets uh, and online banking platforms, or whether somebody wants to integrate us with their ERP and treasury management solution packages, we are there to meet the customer wherever they want to meet us. So it's like one big part of our, of our business. But the other part, which I'll say is, is very pertinent to this question, Brett, that you're asking, which is the, 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 the innovation economy I honestly, I don't think I will ever be or we will ever be in a position to to ourselves innovate and disrupt at the pace at which the 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 economy and the and the and the tech companies are actually able to do that. And so we see a very unique role for ourselves out there as to how do we actually enable them? How do we actually have the right bank that serves as a partner, as an ally to these innovative companies? to help, again, build, you know, unique, beautiful experiences to life for the broader population. Now, that might be, that might be, a, that might be a, a, a Google Glass someday. That might be a new way of uh, processing AP and AR, for example. That might be a unique way of disrupting the food tech industry, for example. It might be ed tech. But we see a very important role for us out there to be a partner to all these innovative companies to help them accelerate uh, their own roadmaps. On the identity stuff, 
um, you know, this partnership that you guys have, part of it is sort of tokenization of identity in, in some respect. Um, we know that um, during the pandemic, CNP fraud, or card not present fraud, fraud has increased. We know identity theft has increased. So there are some weaknesses in uh, you know, uh, current identity infrastructure. How do you guys think we can make um, identity more robust for the 21st century, moving away from mother's maiden name, date of birth, and social security number to, to things like biometrics or um, you know, data heuristics? I can just generally jump in from like an overarching concept. I, I think that there are, there has been a lot of innovative advancements on how to ensure that you're appropriately identifying the person who they are and like that they are the actual person tied to that phone or that payment or that bank account. And there's a lot of ways to do that, that can re that is not super intrusive to the consumer experience. And, and at Platt, I think we, where we think the, where who's going to win, especially in the fintech world, is like who has the most seamless like user experience for consumers when they actually engage with fintechs and doing that in a way that has kind of technology backing and like innovative ways to ensure that you're securely verifying the consumer's um, identity. And we really see that as like a, the, whoever has the, like the cleanest, like best digital front door onto the on, onboarding of consumers um, will win. And so you have to really lean into those user experiences that reduce the friction versus these, you know, legacy, like KBA type of experiences. Those are, those are difficult for consumers. They're low conversion. And then so innovation will help lead into a, like a more secure, but also a better user experience for, for using FinTech apps for sure. Yeah, and, and to, to add on to what Ian said, I mean, I think you already see people investing in authentication. Um, you know, implementing multi-factor authentication, for example, is a way to cut out a lot of those, you know, um, security risks that you have. Um, obviously, like there's kind of the OA 2.0, you know, standards, and, and there's a lot of focus around that. Um, and so there are preventative measures that Plaid is already investing in where we can help financial institutions of all, of all types kind of get there, remove credentials, reduce the aggregate security risk. Um, and I think, you know, when you think about that, but then you also think about other parts of the stack, as Ian was talking about um, through the entire account onboarding process, there's incremental areas to just keep utilizing that power of data to just better, more quickly, more seamlessly um, be able to um, verify uh, identity and therefore be able to create just a much more seamless ecosystem. So um, those are just some of the areas, but certainly there will be a lot more innovation as more um, and different use cases pop up like the biometrics. And I'll just oh. add uh, to, uh, to uh, what, what Ian and Raja was saying. Uh, see, identity and fraud is a, is a, Anybody who's, who's serious about it needs to take a multi-layered approach to identity and fraud, right? Uh, if I think about my home as an example, yes, I actually need the door out there. I need a lock on that door. But in addition to that, I also have a home alarm system, right? And I have the, 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 the camera and the, and, the, and, the, and the floodlights, motion sensors all around. Um, as we think about identity and fraud, we as an organization are investing a lot in this. This is extremely important. Uh, as much as the industry has progressed, so has the has been the proliferation of uh, bad actors out there. And so, from an organization perspective, we are moving away from the so-called knowledge-based uh, questions, mother's maiden name, street address, so on and so forth, and instituting stronger MFA um, that includes uh, um, that includes things like uh, one-time passwords, that includes biometric authentication. So that's like one layer of defense. Additionally, what we're doing is introducing newer technologies like the Cronto codes, for example. Hey, I don't really need you. This is, this is in the industry, this is referred to it as passwordless login, um, device binding. Uh, so we are deploying a lot of uh, those technologies. Additionally, a lot of other uh, work is going on that is actually behind the scenes. The customer doesn't even notice this, right? This is all the fraud prevention technologies where I know where, where Raja is logging into his application for, uh, into, into the app from. We have all these smarts in the system around threat detection. Am I actually seeing Raja at a, at a geolocation that is different from where he historically logs in? 
I'm actually seeing activity on his device that is different from how it normally is. So that's a focus area for the organization over the course of the next uh, couple of months and quarters. Uh, uh, look forward to exchanging more with you all on the journey that the organization is on. But uh, at, this, at, at Silicon Valley Bank, this continues to be an area uh, of uh, great importance for us because this is increasingly what the customers are, are demanding and expecting from all kinds of financial organizations. Fantastic. Um, so where can we find out more about the uh, Silicon Valley Bank and Plaid integration? Um, and, uh, you know, if people want to use this functionality, where do they go? We have a, a page on our uh, svb.com site. Uh, Brett uh, will share with you the link to the specific uh, integration page. Yeah, we can definitely share that with the, uh, the listeners. Um, and and this is uh, this this is essentially uh, not at no additional charge on top of the t- typical ACH fees, right? That is correct. Excellent. Well, uh, Shalene Prakash, Raja Chakravorty, and Ian McAllister, thank you for joining us on Breaking Banks this week. No, thank you, Brett, and thanks to SVB for being a, a great partner and, and, and joining us on this. Fantastic. That's it for Breaking Banks this week. Uh, We'll see you again next week. Thanks for joining us. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks.